Bonjour, euh, je suis heureux aujourd'hui d'accueillir <coughs> pour la première de quatre conférences euh, le professeur Maria Chiara Gasparini. Euh, Maria Chiara Gasparini euh, a été euh, formée à l'université L'Oriental et de Naples, mais également euh, à Pékin, à, euh, à l'université des langues et des cultures. Euh, depuis euh, 2020, elle enseigne à l'université de l'Oregon euh, où elle vient d'être euh, promue professeure associée. Euh, alors, euh, euh, dans le cours de sa carrière, euh, Madame Gasparini a acquis une connaissance, on peut dire, inégalée et directe des euh, fonds de... Euh, textile euh, provenant euh, d'une vaste zone qui est en fait, un, un, comme elle va le montrer, largement un continuum iconographique, euh, qui, une zone qui va de la Chine à Byzance, hein, dans euh, les, les, les siècles de l'Antiquité tardive. Euh, elle, a, euh, elle, a, elle, a, elle a visité, je pense, absolument tous les fonds euh, privé et public où sont conservées ses collections. Elle a notamment travaillé au musée Guimet euh, et euh, elle a donc acquis une connaissance qui est à la fois euh, iconographique, euh, stylistique, mais aussi technique. Chaque fois que ça a été possible, ça ne l'est pas toujours, euh, elle a euh, conduit des observations physiques euh, sur euh, le, le, la, la structure de ses tissus. Alors, euh, euh, elle, va elle va nous montrer dans le cours de ses conférences euh, un grand nombre d'inédits euh, extrêmement spectaculaires euh, qui viennent pour la plupart... Euh, ce sont des inédits qui sont venus par le commerce des Antiquités, parfois récemment, euh, de diverses sources, enfin, la principale étant le Tibet au sens large et notamment les régions orientales, le, 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 dans la province du Tsinghai, euh, mais aussi, euh, aussi l'Afghanistan. Aussi l'Afghanistan, dans des sites qui, qui étaient connus, mais qui n'étaient pas connus pour avoir fourni des, euh, des textiles. Enfin, ça vient vraisemblablement de, de grottes, parce que c'est les seules conditions dans lesquelles ces tissus peuvent se conserver avec, dans un tel état de fraîcheur. Alors, euh, il s'agit donc beaucoup de beaucoup d'inédits euh, qui, dans peut-être d'ici un an, ne le seront plus parce qu'elle les elle va les intégrer dans son deuxième deuxième livre, son premier livre paru, je crois, l'année dernière. Euh, non, 2019. Transcending Patterns, Silk Road Cultural and Artistic Interactions Through Central Asian Textiles, euh, paru à l'université de Hawaï. Elle, elle en prépare donc un deuxième, où il y aura ces nouveaux exemplaires. Euh, voilà, donc euh, euh, elle, a quand même, elle est quand même d'accord si, pour que les conférences soient euh, enregistrées en vidéo. Euh, donc euh, ce sera disponible euh, d'ici deux ou trois jours sur le post podcast du collège. Et euh, nous savons maintenant au collège que euh, euh, le public virtuel qui euh, suit les conférences et les cours par les podcasts est beaucoup plus nombreux et évidemment plus international que le public qui assiste physiquement. Euh, alors je demanderai, mais je pense que le risque, le risque n'existe pas, je demanderai que soient évitées les captures d'écran euh, parce que euh, ça, gêne, ça gêne les conférenciers et puis par ailleurs c'est inutile étant donné que euh, les conférences vont être, euh, vont être euh, diffusées. Voilà, donc sans plus attendre, je passe la parole à, Mar à Maria Chiara et je vais m'asseoir sagement. Merci. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you, uh, Professor Grenet, the Collège de France, for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure and an honor. And I apologize if I do not present in French, actually. <laughs> um, I have been working on Chinese and Central Asian textiles for 20 years. I am currently working on textile and metal work from Qinghai or traded across Qinghai, uh, province of China and the Trans-Himalayas between the 5th and 9th centuries. 
which uh, will include also the formation of the Tibetan Empire in the 7th century. And I will discuss a little bit more about that in my third lecture here. But today I will focus on the pre-Tibetan period. And these are preliminary results um, of uh, textile material that I researched last summer in Gansu, Qinghai, Sichuan, uh, in China, and Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, I came across two private collections that include uh, various Wei silk items, which I argue were used by the Tuyuhun, the Ephthalites, and the Tocharians, or Kuchens. To reconstruct the provenance of these items, their trade and their usage, we first need to look at the historical context and the nomadic movement that occurred between the 4th and 7th centuries in Central Asia and in China. Um, and then look at the development of silk jean productions. Eventually I will show some of the textile uh, items and discuss how and why they can be traced back to the Tuyuhun, the, or the Ephthalites and the Tocharians. Between the 3rd and 7th centuries, the Sassanian, the last pre-Islamic Iranian dynasty, established the first post-Hellenic civilization on an imperial scale and shaped some of the most important ideas which were often expressed with the visual and material culture that through trade and diplomatic exchanges connected East and West across the border uh, of known and unknown places in Central Asia. The Sassanian um, inherited a lot from the Parthian uh, in terms of also traditions and iconographies and also thanks to the contribution of non-Iranian people, such as Turco-Mongolic and Chinese population, this heritage spread across Eurasia as new forms that, although similar, show distinctive features different from the Parthian and the Sassanian. While sedentary people often established the rules of trade, commerce, and diplomacy, the nomadic or semi-nomadic populations mediated such practices through clothing, objects of art, and weapons. They readapted figurative archetypes into new patterns that were assimilated and spread from the Mediterranean to Japan. And the Sogdians are often referred to as the merchants of the Silk Road, with the understanding to be the only agent involved in the trade between Iran and China, um, being Sogdiana part uh, of the Sassanian Empire. Sogdian colony were established in China, and Sogdian chief in charge of these communities were also appointed with the name of Sabao. The portrait of periodical offerings of Liao, Liang dynasty, as well as a later version by the artist Yan Li Ben dated to the 7th century and entitled The Gathering of Kings, however, document and confirm the involvement and recognition of other people, at least in the diplomatic trade with China. These scroll paintings offer an overview of their clothing and their differences and similarities, as also found in mural paintings, coins, and pottery from other areas. Although the Sogdian were the primary agents, as I say, that, sh that shaped this trade, Ephthalite, Tocharians, Turks, and Tuyuhun, who had contact with the Chinese, were among those who participated in what later became known as the cosmopolitan style of the Tang dynasty. The origin of these people is still debated. Chinese sources point to the Altai region and sometimes identify both the Ephthalites and Tocharian as Yuezhe, or more specifically as Da Yuezhe, the Greater Yuezhe, who were different from the Xiao Yuezhe, or smaller Yuezhe, who instead uh, migrated to Qinghai Tibet Plateau. And there are many uh, ideas and hypotheses about these people. Uh, they were described as nomadic or sedentary people who spoke um, different languages than other uh, Hu or non-Chinese. 
And uh, as Professor Etienne de la Vissière argued, they might, uh, we might trace the origin of the ephthalite to an episode of massive migration in the second half of the fourth century, not to a whole set of migration. Despite the lack of information, the mural painting of the ba in Bamiyan and Kucha um, in the Buddhist cave complexes are a testament um, to their solid and influential presence in Bactria, Tokaristan and the western region of China. Documents in Tokarian languages have been found in the Taklamakan Desert. However, we should differentiate those people living in Tokaristan uh, properly named Tokarian, from those living in the Tarim Basin, or more specifically the area of Kucha and Anni, who have been named Tokarian for a long time, but they should be instead referred to as Kuchans. Under the Ephthalite nomadic elite, the Sogdiana became prosperous, and eventually by the 6th century, altogether they allied with the Turks from the northern steppes, who in uh, 552 established their first Kaganate and uh, succeeded the Ranran, which successively split into western and eastern uh, Turkic Kaganate. In the meantime, in what is present-day China, at the end of the 4th century, the Toba people, who descended from the Xianbei state of the steppes that had disintegrated a century earlier, established the Northern Wei dynasty. They were eventually succeeded by um, other dynasties in the north and in the south, beyond the Yellow River. And those in the south established their capital at Jiangkang, uh, that is there on the map. Uh, there was a strategic point for trading with Sichuan along the Yangtze River. The lack of administrative skills forced the northern nomads to accept the Chinese administrative structure, but at the same time, they also created a military system that included Chinese people among their own. The lack of blood lineage, the absence of divine ancestor, and the empowerment of local elite and regional rulers who exchange a pledge of loyalty in return for an official appointment created a sense of unity among these people. Their known Chinese background made them more receptive to foreign items. The foreign object discovered in Pinchang, the capital of the Northern Wei, who eventually moved to Luoyang in 493, and also another uh, Xianbei elite tomb in Ningxiao in Inner Mongolia, confirmed their exchange with people from Central Asia. A famous plate found in a Fenghou Tu tomb in Datong was likely produced in present-day Afghanistan or Turkmenistan and is comparable to another silver plate in New York that shows a very similar composition, allegedly from Afghanistan as well. The two Yuhun, like the Wei, also descended from the Xianbei. Kagan Muron to Yuhun moved his people from Liaoning in northeast China to Qinghai, where he subjugated local populations. His descendants were eventually joined by other Xianbei tribes, which formed the Tu Yuhun, as properly known, who in Tibetan sources are recorded as Aja. These people extended their kingdom from Qinghai to Gansu, Ningxia, a little bit of Sichuan, and part of Tibet, and also part of uh, a little bit part of Xinjiang and Shanxi, and were eventually conquered by the Tibetan in 663. Chinese sources, such as the Book of Liang in the 6th century, mentioned that the Tuyuhun served as translators for the Ephthalite and mediated their trade in China. Such information suggests that the Tuyuhun and the Ephthalite possibly spoke a similar or identical Proto-Mongolic language. But beside the language, these people also shared similar customs and traditions. Archaeological excavation around the Qinghai Lake or Kokonor have revealed a few fortified uh, Tuyuhun settlements, such as Shudun, a city in uh, Gonghe County, that is the red area on the map there, which was their capital until uh, 540, and then they moved the capital to Fuchi, 15 uh, Li, about 7.5 kilometers west of. Uh, Qinghai Lake. 
Although the city had inner and outer walls, people continued to live in tent, following their original pastoral lifestyle, like the Northern Way in Pinchang, which was described as a tent city. And here we have two examples. Uh, one is a detail of um, tent on a coffin plank from uh, to Yehun tombs, and the other one is a, a wall painting from uh, a Northern Way um, tomb, and you can see different type of tent even on wheels. And I will talk about this a little bit uh, later. In 439, for the first time, the two Yuhun were attacked by the Northern Way in the Taidan Basin, in the northern eastern part of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, which had become an essential cross-border location. The attack continued until 470. Eventually, peace was established, and between 473 and 534, the two Yuhun sent 56 envoys to the Northern Wei court and other envoys to the Northern Qi. Throughout the 6th century, the two Yuhun traded a large quantity of silk and Sichuanese horses, Qinghai, Paibal horses, Persian mares, camels, and yaks. Also envoy from Kucha, Khotan, Gaochang in Xinjiang and Persia used the Tuyuhun Road across Qinghai, Sichuan and along the Yangtze River, that is the, uh, the line in red there, to Jiangkang, that as I mentioned is the, was the capital of the Southern Dynasty. Uh, Persian embassies um, are portrayed in the uh, portrait or periodical offering of Lian Dynasty that I showed you before. And the text that accompanies the portrait of this emissary quotes from the Mong Dao An treatise of the Kingdom of the Western Regions and says, and I quote, in the second year of the Tsong Da Tong reign period in 530, an emissary was sent via Gandhara to present the thought of the Buddha. Although it doesn't provide more information regarding the origin of the emissary, the passage suggests that possibly he took the southern to Yuhun route through Qinghai to Sichuan and from there along the Yangtze River and he reached Jiangkang, the capital of the southern dynasties. While the tombs excavated in Qinghai, which I will discuss in more detail today, might be only partially attributed to the Tuyuhun, those recently excavated in Gansu province can be with cert uh, certainty attributed to them. In 2019, Chinese archaeologists unearthed the tomb of Murongzhi, known as the King of Xi, the third son of the last Tuyuhun Khan, who died in 691, at the beginning of the Tibetan period, uh, near Wu Wei. This one uh, is um, one of the 23 Tang period royal Tuyuhun tombs across four areas that continue to be excavated until uh, 2021. Uh, but it's the only one in the Changsha village that is the red triangles on the map. And as you can see, it's very far from the other triangle in purple and black that are in different areas. An epitaph in the corridor at the entrance in Tuyuhun language refers to the site as the mausoleum of the Great Khan. For this reason, it is possible that Muron Mohobo, the first Qin, king of uh, Qinghai, uh, was also buried in the tomb after the Tuyuhun submitted to the Tang dynasty because the Tibetan uh, arrived. The Muron clan controlled Qinghai Lake and its um, surrounding territories, while other kings were responsible for guarding their own areas and taking order from the Muron Khan. The variety of textile material excavated is well preserved and has been analyzed and published in Chinese in uh, this monograph and also in a few short English articles. In terms of structure and style, the Tuyuhun tombs in Wu Wei, which has not mount like those in Qinghai, show strong connection with the Xianbei elite. Now moving to the actual textiles. 
Cotton, wool and silk had been available in various forms and structure along the Silk Road network for a long time. Still, cotton was only officially recorded in Chinese document in 477. A contract discovery in Nia in Xinjiang mentioned a Sogdian merchant sales of an enslaved Iranian for 101 bolts of cotton. Until the 3rd century, the production of refined silk remained secretive and China will only allow the export of Finnish silk of damaged silk yarn to the West. We have two main types of pattern weavings, both called jean, and mistranslated into Western languages as brocades. And I always point out that it's not a brocade. One is the warp face weaving and the other is the weft face weaving. And I will simply refer to them as warp jean and weft jean to make it uh, clear. The warp jean technique is attributed to China. Four mean, mini jean looms were discovered in a Han Dynasty tomb in Sichuan in 2013. Between the 5th and 6th centuries, unspun weft jean silk eventually began to be reproduced in the western region of China. The assimilation of such techniques occurred through the acquisition of western wool uh, weft jean, which was initially woven in the Mediterranean or uh, the Near East at the beginning of the first century CE. And one of the very earliest example is um, from Syria, uh, dated apparently to the third century, is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. By the 3rd and 4th century, around the Taklamakan, such compounds were only woven in Z-spun silk. Eventually, by the 5th century, unspun silk weaving uh, made with the real silk fibers appeared. Early examples show Iranian motifs, such as a large wing pedestal uh, combined with Chinese characters. Such texts that were generally made and used as tributes or gifts to foreign people. However, despite the advancement in silk technology, in the 7th century, silk textiles around the Taklamakan were still limited to specific areas. The pilgrim monk Xuanzang recorded that in Khotan, and I quote, in the past, neither the mulberry tree nor the silkworm was known. And those, the king asked for a bride from the east and asked her to bring some mulberry seed to make silk garment for herself. She eventually secretly smuggled the seed in her hair or hat to pass the frontier, as it is also vis uh, visually recorded on a wooden panel uh, from a Buddhist shrine in Dandaulik near Khotan, now in the British Museum of Art, which is very uh, well known. Xuanzang also reported that only people from Kucha dress in jean cloth and people from Khotan produce and wore spun silk in great quantity. According to the record, however, compared to the silk produced in the eastern part of the country, Khotanese textiles were made with spun silk derived from mulberry and a miscellaneous of plants used to feed the silkworms. Because of Buddhist tradition in the area, silkworms were not killed and only when they had changed into moth and broken away from the cocoons could silk be reeled. Eventually, by the 8th century, the weft gene, also known as a samite or samite, completely substitute the warp gene. So, during the Northern and Southern Dynasty period, there were four primary areas of silk production in China. Northern region, southern region, Xinjiang, and Sichuan. Both northern and southern dynasty had institution for the supervision of handcraft. Professional weavers produced silk textile on the ruler behalf and by ordinary people, especially women, uh, women of the farming class. During the northern way, the, uh, the production of silk was maintained in the main plains, uh, Shanxi, Shandong, Henan, uh, also on the north in Hebei province. However, once the capital was established at Pinchang, many artisans were relocated from the other provinces and the city became the main center of silk productions. 
The Northern Wei began producing a type of weaving recorded as Wei Jin, which was traded to the Western region. Artisans from the north were also moved to the south between the 4th and 5th century, and Jin workshop uh, was, uh, were established in Jiankang. By the 6th century, southern silk had improved and was also sent in the north. Xinjiang silk was mainly produced in Gaochang, Kucha and Hotan. Although the court regulated these productions, the Chinese did not appreciate the Xinjiang pattern jean, which was considered less refined. The Xinjiang jean was measured in jiang, meaning pieces about one meter wide, exactly like the Persian silk, Bosa jean, which is mentioned for the first time in a document from a tomb in Gaochang, dated to 482, although might have been sent to China with the Persian Embassy in 455, and different from um, Chinese silk that instead was measured in Duan, or a certain length, and P or bolt, of 50.68 uh, cm wide and 9.21 uh, cm long, so it was a very precise measurement. A particular type of silk from Kucha was recorded for the first time in two documents discovered in Turfan dated between the 5th and 6th centuries. The document informs us that the so-called Kuchan pattern silk, Chozhe Jin, was measured in Jiang and imitated in Gaochang. It was also used as currency to buy slaves. As well um, as demonstrated by Satomi Yama, a possible example of Kuchan silk might be a fragment made of spun silk with yellow ground and a grid pattern discovered um, along with the golden treasures, including this mask with garnet in the Boma Cemetery um, in uh, Kazakh Autonomous Prefecture in Xinjiang in red um, on the map. This textile appears in many Buddhist caves used for the seat of Buddhas or for uh, monastic robe, uh, robes in uh, both Kucha and Dunhuang Buddhist caves. But more importantly, it also found in Bamyan Cave 111, which apparently has been radiocarbon dated to the 5th century. And here a donor, probably an ephthalite, is wearing a robe made of uh, this textile. Finally, Sichuan, which had always been one of the most important silk hubs uh, and at this time was controlled by the southern dynasties, continued producing the most exquisite pattern Shu Jin, which was in such high demand that strict purchasing controls were established due to the high numbers of merchants in Chengdu, including the Sassania, who also arrived via sea from Canton. Written sources and some textile examples discovered in other areas, including Xinjiang, will confirm a Sichuanese silk production in Persian style. The production of, of multicolored Persian jean, including golden weaving, began in Sichuan in the 5th century and continued and evolved until later. The Book of Liang mentioned that the Persian wore golden jean robes at wedding ceremonies. The Book of the Xue Dynasty also confirmed the Chinese replication of such golden textiles in Sichuan in the 6th century. And for instance, here in chapter 68, we can read the Persian presented to the emperor a beautifully woven gown of jean in golden uh, thread. The emperor ordered He Chou to reproduce it. He began to weave and succeed in, in the making of a type even more beautiful than the one sent as a gift. The emperor was extremely satisfied. These silks were traded across Qinghai and therefore across the Tuyuhun kingdom. Eventually Chinese replicas of Persian weft jin made in Sichuan in the 7th century reached Japan and were recorded as a shoko kin, as I will discuss later. However, except for the forehand replica of the warp gene looms that I showed you before, discovered in Sichuan, no example of weft gene looms have, uh, have been discovered yet. As I previously mentioned, I came across some clothing and textile items in Hong Kong that I had never seen before. They caught my attention because they looked unique. 
Still, they also record the attires of horseback riders and farmers portrayed on a group of coffins from Qinghai dated to the Tuyuhun period, which I will show in comparison with this textile material. These textile items, which were acquired in the 90s in Kathmandu, Nepal, allegedly come from Qinghai. Not all of them, but many of them, were created as matching set, generally including a robe, large trousers, a hat, boots, and sometimes a saddle, a horse cover, quiver and bow holder, and horse chaffron. The Tuyuhun coffins, which were initially lacquered, include images of the grassland lifestyle. Procession of horse rider, hunting scenes in the mountain, also funerary rides, and they are all enclosed in large red frames with dots. More importantly, the costume of these people and their tent suggests their social rank. On six coffin panels from the Qinghai Huanyuan Ancient Road Museum, farmers, pastors and workers wear clothes different from the horseback riders and chiefs. The first group of people are depicted in the field or grassland and wear simple monochromatic robe with or without a lapel, a black belt and no hat. In contrast, the second group of people who are depicted in mountain sceneries wear more complex pattern clothing, including cloak or coat laid on the shoulder, hat with colorful long ribbon on the back and large hat. Their horses are richly adorned with colors, harnesses and elaborate saddles, all decorated with colorful trims and facial chaffrons like those of the Northern Way. Only two panels of these six that I just showed to you show images of white tent, possibly made of felt, decorated with simple red lines and with the top opening for the smoke of the fireplace inside. On the first panel, two small tents are placed next to each other in a field. The one on the right is open and shows a man wearing a typical Northern Way style hat and play the lute. On the second panel, a much larger tent is depicted in mountain scenery. A small gable roof covers the smoke opening at the top and the outer tent covering is folded at the bottom at the two sides of the entrance, showing the wooden lattice structure of the tent, which appears identical to the yurt in use today in Mongolia and Central Asia, or Kazakhstan, to be precise. The tent is open and shows a man, probably a chief, kneeling on a rug. He has a moustache and long hair and wears a red robe open on the right and a tall black headdress similar to the type also in use among the Northern Way people. An attendant is standing in front of him and at his feet there is a bowl with food and a jar that records the set of tableware items from the Muronje tomb in Gansu. Similar scenes appear on a 6th century Sinosognian funerary couch uh, from uh, the Chinese Central uh, uh, Plains, now in the Mio Museum in Japan. On the other panels, horseback riders wear elaborate clothing hat, uh, such as a wide brim ear flap with a long ribbon on the back. In two of these panels, we can see a man leading the group of horse uh, covered with a black caparison and a red chaffron while launching a spear. An animal, perhaps a hunting dog with a red ribbon around his neck, appeared in front of him. Very similar dog sculpture, again, were found in the Moronju uh, tomb in Gansu. As I mentioned, the two private collections in Hong Kong have provided physical evidence of such attires as depicted on the Tuyuhun coffins. The boots have been heavily restored and might have been altered. Nonetheless, the texts are used are original and mostly dated from the Northern Dynasty to the Xue Dynasty period. Similar pairs of boots with the same features are also held in the Kotzen collection in the Textile Museum in Washington, D.C. Beside the embroidery, what they have in common is what I call the rainbow trim, because they have this multicolor trim, tubular with the chevron motif, now it's darkened, um, are details that appear on many textiles excavated uh, in Qinghai. 
Most likely these boots were originally taller and padded like those in Hong Kong. However, among those in Hong Kong, only this pair is created with purple silk with various monochromatic tortoise shell motif that match a pair of trousers and a hood hat of the same type. The others are embroidered motif that might be found in Central Asia. Textile with such type of tortoise shell uh, patterns were discovered in Dunhuang Cave 130 and in Dulan in Qinghai. The new history of the Tang mentioned a tortoise back lining being used among the garment of Emperor Taizong. Likely, this type of tortoise shell pattern textiles was added later to the boots during the restoration, but it's not excluded that such textile was already used during the Wei period. Interestingly, one of these pairs shows a complex sole made with rhombi pattern of wool knots that recall the sole of the Scythian leather boots from the Altai dated to the 4th century BCE. But the most important items of this collection in Hong Kong are the hat. A large black hat made of thick and coarse animal hair that looks like a scarecrow hat used by farmers a wide brim felt hat with the long red dyed yak hair at the top and a double ear flap hat with the long patchwork and embroidered ribbons, seven precisely, some with the lamb of sheep fur, both used by the horsemen depicted on the coffins. A similar hat but without ear flap made with Wei Jin is also held in the China National Silk Museum. The scarecrow hat is woven as a tight basket structure, braided, interlaced at the bottom, and a circular wooden frame inside that is still partially visible. The lining around the circumference of the head is created with plain blue silk and a warp jean with a colorful hexagonal open grid pattern, and there is also a yellow silk ribbon used to tie the hat under the chin. The pattern silk uh, with small flower used for the lining is probably the most important part of this hat. It is in fact a rare type of textile which is mainly found in the Kucha area in Xinjiang. The skirt of Queen's Wayambraba, depicted with King Totiga in Maya Cave 205 in Kizil, dated after 550 between the 6th and 7th century, is one of the best known example, or I, I should say was one since we don't have this painting because it was destroyed during um, World War II. Still other royal or Buddhist monks clothing or votive textile items from the caves are made with textile with similar hexagonal grid patterns. It also appears depicted on a small votive umbrella made of rami discovered in a Buddhist sanctuary east of Kucha. And you can see the pattern here and also here. Interestingly, similar red ground silk dated to the 7th century, labeled as Soko Jin or Shu Jin, meaning Sichuanese silk, were acquired in the Oryuji and Todaiji in Nara, Japan, is this one here. However, an early wood fragment discovered in Lulan, possible from the 3rd century, and another weft gene wood fragment held in the Yu Museum in San Francisco confirmed that such patterns were producing different materials and structure for a long time. Unlike the other example, the fragment in the Young Museum shows an hexagonal close grid pattern with alternate rosette and birds in pairs and car carry the Greek pie signs like those on the hem of the Queen's skirt in the wall painting. Yorin de Ebert, who is one of the first scholars who discussed these types of textile in Kucha, suggested that these were copied from Parthian textiles made of wool, which were acquired in Xinjiang and Sichuan at the beginning of the first millennium CE. The double ear flap hat are made with various types of silk and embroidery in wool and silk. They have a wooden step protrusion at the top to hold the feather, and those with fur are padded, as I mentioned before. They, as I also mentioned, were part of a clothing set. For instance, 
This one is made of a very similar type of textile um, in weft jean with a geometric grid, small palmetto leaves, wing motif, and a repetition of the Chinese character G or speciousness. The coat, which is open on the front, could be fastened at the collar with a long, wide red ribbon. Possibly it was tied at the neck and left loose on the shoulder like a cloak or cape, as seen among the horse rider on the coffins. The second padded hat, trimmed with fur, is made of dark brown warp jean, featuring small roundels enclosing a crescent surrounded by dots, a rosette, and a three-dot motif, which are all Iranian motif. A chaffron made of an identical textile is also now held in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The collection also includes a quiver and a bow cover made with the same textile as the hat. Similar types of patchwork composition were, were also excavated in Qinghai. In terms of shapes, these items are comparable to those in the Kotzen collection in Washington, D.C., uh, and dated to the same period. These in D.C. are made with embroidered beaded circle, enclosing a crescent, and trimmed with the Northern Way silk. Finally, the last ear flap hat is not padded or trimmed with fur like the previous two, but still holds the step protrusion wooden element at the top. Beside the long seven ribbons on the back, either embroidered or patchworked, this hat also carries a panel at the nape of the head. The panel is made as a red and white warp jean featuring a geometric pattern resembling an abstraction of the Iranian wings with ribbons that were reproduced on silk during the Northern Way period, such as the one that I showed you before from Xinjiang. The main fabric of the hat is a Chinese damask embroidered with a repetition of small circle that record the warp jean on the previous hat. So we have those woven and those embroidered. In this case, the ear flaps show a large leaf motif and an abstract motif framed by dots of various colors, similar to those found on an embroidered piece from Samangan province in Afghanistan now in the Al-Sabah Al collection in Kuwait, um, which has been radiocarbon dated to uh, and show the radiocarbon analysis show 465 plus minus 25 years um, old. Uh, the piece also featured be the randal, including boar heads. Similar pieces are now held in various collections worldwide and allegedly acquired all across the Trans Himalaya, including a quiver in the Kyushu National uh, Museum in Japan that still shows the original red color of the ground, and also a beautiful horse cover in the Textile Museum in Washington that I had the pleasure to uh, analyze last December and will be exhibited in uh, 2026 in a dedicated uh, exhibition. The boar head was one of the most popular Iranian or Central Asian, I would say, motif adopted beyond the Iranian cultural spheres in Buddhist world painting in Bamiyan, Kizil, like you see here, Kizil Cave 77, to Yuk and Duhuang, and is also found as warp and weft gene excavated in Xinjiang. Leather embroidery, which I believe um, are properly Chinese, generally show four square motif that recall the Chinese character Hui, which is different from the types of early embroidery that, as you can see, do not show this kind of square. On both types, however, the boar is always depicted with an open mouth and a long tongue sticking out, which differentiated from the kind of boar on textile from the Western areas. As you can see from this wool embroidery uh, there on top, most likely Iranian, and it also appeared on an attendant garment in the rock relief in Takebustan. Many scholars have attributed the boar to the Zoroastrian god Veritragna, but this is the only one, the only animal depicted with, without the full body, among all the animals that generally are depicted in the roundels. 
Borhead in Randalls also appear on what have been called the fashion vases from Pakistan and Afghanistan that they either to the Kushan Sassanian or also early Islamic period. And also, for instance, to metal work. And here is an example in DC. And in this case, the bore uh, has a closed mouth, again, not open one. Uh, in a banquet scenes depicted a Balalik tape in Tokaristan, dated to between the 6th and 7th centuries, I believe, we can see a man wearing a one lapel robe with randals, enclosing tusk animal head, which might resemble boar head, but this is only a, a reconstruction, the graphic reconstruction. Uh, more likely, the head was not the representation of a god, but possibly a trophy of the Iranian royal hand, as also Matteo Comparedi discussed. In any case, textile items embroidered with boar head in randal and heart shaped leaves mainly appeared across the trans Himalayas between the 4th and 7th century and were used to decorate hunting clothing set. Although the silk is mainly from the Northern Way, this ear flap hat was not used by the Northern Way, who instead whose hood hat as a mark of the Shambay elite. Ear flap hat or helmet, which would not entirely fit the head, but held, uh, held almost on top of the head, were called kola and used by the Parthian from the 2nd century BCE until the end of their dynasty in the 3rd century CE, and also by the Sassanians at the very beginning of their dynasty, along with a cloak or a coat laid on the shoulder and tied at the neck, known as Candice, a fashion that was acquired by the Northern Way, Tuyuhun, Tokarian or Eftalite, and later also by the Tibetans. Such hats with the ear flap were possibly introduced to the Iranian during the Achaemenid Empire in the 6th century BCE by the Sakya Scythians as portrayed in the Apadani in Persepolis, although, as you can see, they are quite different in terms of shape. Um, material evidence with a wooden zoomorphic protrusion and golden stag embellishment or covered with gold foils was discovered in Pazirik in the Altai. Although the protrusion atta attached to the hat that I described are much simpler and currently do not show any zoomorphic form, they still include small pieces of feathers and also seen, um, um, as also seen among the horseback rider depicted on the coffins. Such wooden protrusion might have initially supported extra golden er uh, ornament as well. Identical pieces were, in fact, discovered in the largest of the tomb in Reshwe in Dulan in Qinghai, near a golden casket and once functioned as support for, support for gilt uh, silver plaques in the shape of phoenixes standing at the top on top of this casket. And they have exactly the same type of protrusions. A similar attires appear also on a silver saddle ornament in the same collection in Hong Kong. Uh, you can see archer on horseback wearing a helmet, hat with floating ribs, falcon, palmettes, a ruler between two lions, and also two lovers, often depicted in... Oh, doesn't show the image here, but the two lovers also depicted in early uh, Tibetan um, art. The provenance, and provenance of these saddles decoration is unknown. I have not found any similar examples and unfortunately I cannot confirm whether it is to Yuhun, early Tibetans or something else. However, the coffins are the only visual example dating to the Tuyuhun period that offer a glimpse of their costumes and some evidence to contextualize and trace the possible provenance of the textile material in Hong Kong and also other collections worldwide. As I have previously mentioned, colorful patchworks or the preference for multicolored trims and embroideries seem to be the main features that distinguish these items, mostly made with Northern Way silk, which copied Parthian and then Sassanian wool textiles. To conclude, between the 5th and 7th centuries, Qinghai became a crucial region for cultural and artistic transmission between China and Central Asia, including Sichuan. 
But the interrelationship of nomadic population of Proto-Mongolic and Iranian origin also occurred along the so-called Tuyuhun Road and the Yanza River, and uh, from Qinghai also to the trans Himalaya and Central Asia at large, which was likely that land that later was described as Turan in Islamic sources, opponent of Iran on the other side. Although some of the material presented, especially textile, without a doubt, might look Iranian or Central Asia, they show composition that were instead created explicitly for or used by the Tuyuhun, the Eftalite or Kuchan or Tokarians, uh, who shared much with the Northern Way and developed a style that was eventually acquired and retransformed by the Tibetan in between the 7th and 8th century as I will discuss in my third lecture here. Thank you very much.